like to introduce our next speaker, Elena Fuchnarari. She's also a UWC Atlantic College alumni, and she's a... <laughs> and also a peace builder practitioner that takes innovative design and technology to promote peace and prevent conflict. One of the main, many reasons that we asked her to be a speaker at our conference was due to her work in post-conflict and conflict areas such as Sudan, Libya, Somalia, and Iraq. Some of her most recent works include co-founding BuildUp, which is a social enterprise that combines technology, peace building, and civic engagement. And one of her most recent works include um, Build Peace, which is a conference on peace building and technology. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome her to the stage. No! Um, so thanks for the lovely introduction, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you for the, for the invite. Um, I love the title of this conference. Um, this idea about the relationship between peace and politics. And I want to talk to you about what I think that relationship is like in my experience uh, in the work that I've done as a peace builder. So you already know that I went to Atlantic College and, uh, and you mentioned that I founded an organization called Build Up. Uh, before that, I was actually working for the United Nations for a while, managing a peace building program. And I guess in a way, that experience was what led to Build Up. Uh, and I'll explain how, what that journey was a little bit because it also explains how I see this relationship between peace and politics that hopefully will spark an interesting conversation. So Build Up, you already mentioned, it's a social enterprise. We work at the intersection of technology, peace building, and civic engagement. And you know that maybe sounds a little bit abstract. What we try to do is we work with civic activists and peace builders to broaden participation in peace processes. Um, and often we do so by introducing information, communication, and networking technologies. But there's a lot more to it than just the technologies. It's a lot about the process. We believe that the key thing that technology does is broaden participation in peace building processes. So that really what they become are civic engagement processes that deal with conflict. If you want to know more about our work, it's on the website. I thought I'd give you the link in case you want to find out about it. Um, you also mentioned the conference that we run annually. Uh, the conference is open to anybody, so if you're interested in participating, it's actually in Zurich uh, in September of this year, um, and that's the website for the conference. Um, so do look it up if you're interested. Um, and then for the rest of the time, I'm not going to talk directly about my work. I'm going to try and give you some ideas about this peace and politics thing that I think you've been discussing. So before I explain, um, what I mean by peace building is civic engagement. I thought we'd need to agree on what we meant by peace building. Um, maybe this is something you've been debating a lot in the past few days. I'm going to give you my own definition. Um, and people often get mixed up with these three, right? So peacekeeping. That's the dudes in the blue helmets, essentially, OK? Some women also, mostly guys, in blue helmets, basically standing between two warring parties and stopping them from fighting from aggressing each other, protecting civilians. That's peacekeeping. Peacemaking. That's the dudes in the ties, mostly in the UN or in Geneva, so in New York, in Geneva, in various other capital cities in Addis Ababa. Depends on the, on the exact peace agreement. And again, it's mostly men and usually sitting around a table signing an agreement. So that's peacemaking. And that's where people say on a piece of paper, we don't want to fight anymore. And then there's peace building. And peace building is everything else. Peace building is everything that you need so that the peacekeepers can go away. It's everything that you need so that the peacemaking holds, so that the agreements hold on the ground, so that people believe that these agreements are true. And peace building is what I spend most of my time doing. Um, it's not very glamorous. I thought I'd show you this picture because people, I don't know, maybe have a great image of peace building. This is when we had a flat tire. I spent a lot of time finding spare tires in peace building work. A lot of it is logistics, it's operational, it's boring. A lot of it is driving around, sitting with small groups of people, trying to talk about what's happening, how they see what is going on around them and the agreements that have been signed. In this particular, um, this is actually when I was still working for the UN um, and I was in Sudan. And uh, in Sudan, it was actually all one country when I was there. It's now split in two. Um, and there had been a, a comprehensive peace agreement. Um, and the comprehensive peace agreement dealt mostly with the civil war in between southern Sudan and Sudan. And it talked very much about the border area between Sudan and South Sudan. And this border area is disputed for various reasons that I won't go into now. 
Now, the agreement was signed. It was signed in the capital city by the leaders. But the people on the ground didn't necessarily know that this agreement had been signed, what it meant for them, and that it actually meant they could construct a new way of life. So what we did in a lot of our work, in the peace building work, is we literally drove around and we held <coughs> festivals. We held football matches. We held conversations. We had people map out what they believed were their dreams. We had people tell stories about the past. And that is the core of what peace building is about. OK, so that's peace building. What about civic engagement? I mean, civic engagement, right, it it's sounds like it's quite an easy thing. Civic engagement is just participation in the public sphere. It means you vote. It means you participate somehow in your society. I think there's something that I just wanted to, to kind of bring out a little bit more so that we get beyond that superficial idea of what civic engagement is. One thing is to think that you can participate in your society by giving feedback, right? So voting is a way of feedback. <coughs> you can also write to your government or you can talk to people who organize things in your community. You can give feedback about what is <coughs> happening. But there's a problem with thinking about participation only as feedback, which is that that can also be a way, a way of relying too much on institutions. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you're going to give feedback to an institution, and that's going to be your way of engaging with society, it's not working. So you just missed that whole part. Right? Is that better? Yeah. All right. Um, so if you're going to think of, feed, of participation as feedback, then you're really relying on institutions. You're really relying on governments responding to the feedback you're giving, or to large organizations responding to the feedback you're, you're giving. And that depends on whether they have the capacity to respond. And there may be places or situations in which institutions don't have the capacity to respond to what you're th saying and the change you want to see. The second thing is that if we just think that participation is feedback, it's very easy to whitewash anything with a civic engagement. To say, oh, we're listening to people. So we're doing civic engagement. We're doing participation. But if there's no real response, then maybe that's not really participation. It's not really civic engagement. So I think we need to think of participation not only as feedback to institutions, but also as action. What do I mean by that? I mean community action, advocacy, local responses, activism, all of these other things that are also a way of civic engagement. And so with that kind of distinction, I thought I'd give you an example because it gets a little bit abstract very quickly, right? So civic engagement is participation in the public sphere, and that can be something like Ushahidi. Ushahidi is a project that was set up by Kenyan activists. Um, and they set up um, an online map where people could send in reports of violence that they saw during the elections in Kenya. It was a way for the public to report on what they were seeing around them. It was a way of doing feedback. But there was very little response to that feedback. Peace Text, also an initiative in Kenya, also dealing with electoral violence. But the difference is that they set up a system not only for people to report the violence that they were seeing, but also a system to respond to, uh, to violence. What they had was a system where they could send out text messages to areas where there was a lot of tension, so that sending out basically messages of peace, of hope, so that people would know that even though they were seeing things that were very tense on the ground, there, was also, there were also people who were thinking about peace. <coughs> So a difference here, Ushahidi was all about, let's get people to tell us what is happening on the ground, and somebody will do something about it, an institution will be, do something about it. Peace Text was saying, we're going to get people to tell us what's happening on the ground, and we're going to, to provide some kind of a civic response to it, a local response to it, by sending out messages of peace. And I guess with that, I've kind of told you what I mean about peace building a civic engagement. Um, I think it's really important to try to understand how this idea of people participating uh, intersects with this idea of building peace. And of building peace, not just by signing agreements and having 
uh, people like the UN standing in between warring parties, but really by everybody engaging in what peace is. I, was, I wanted to tell you a story from Spain, which is where I'm from, uh, to illustrate that example. In Spain, I think you probably know, um, we had a dictator, Franco, um, and in 1964, Franco celebrated 25 years in power. And he celebrated it with the slogan, 25 years of peace, right? But for many activists for democracy, against Franco, against fascism, this really wasn't peace. And so they had a counter slogan. And their counter slogan was, we don't want the peace of the graveyards. Right? That wasn't peace for them. So peace building <coughs> as civic engagement simply means that if you really want to build peace, you can't force one idea of peace on people. It means that you have to be open to many discourses instead of accepting the majority's view as the only truth. A peace built like this may, may seem more fragile, but it's actually much truer and much deeper and much more sustainable in the long term. I told you earlier about the peace building work that I was doing in, in Sudan. And um, one of the things that is, is quite sad for me about the, the work that we were doing there is that it was a complete failure. Not me personally, but all of us who were engaging in peace building there. And the reason for it is that a lot of emphasis was put on signing an agreement on this one idea of what peace looked like. And very little emphasis was put on the actions and that build all the different ideas and all the different concepts of peace that needed to be done on the ground. So the kind of work that we were doing driving around, that wasn't given a lot of importance. And so the sad ending is that war has returned to the regions on the border between Sudan and South Sudan. And I think a lot of that is because people put too much emphasis on an agreement, on the peacemaking, on a singular idea of peace, instead of on really getting people to engage with peace, to be civically engaged with peace. And to me, that was really a failure of empowerment. That made me ask some questions. What had we really done wrong here? Why had we failed to get people engaged in peace? And how are people empowered to be civic agents, to take action on peace? Doesn't matter how many peace agreements you sign, if people don't get personally involved in building the peace that needs to be built. Now, I, obviously I don't have all the answers to those questions. I wish I did. I have an answer to that question. I have the answer of the work that we've tried to do. Um, and that work is to think about what technology is doing to give more power to people. And specifically, what information, communications, and networking tools are doing to give people more power. I think that new technologies have meant that more people know about things, they have more information, they have a more clearly heard and a harder to ignore voice, they're better at communicating, and they're more networked with each other. And that's happening all over the place, not only in places that have a lot of internet connectivity or perfect mobile phone coverage. <coughs> Things that before were only possible for large organizations with a lot of human resources and a lot of financial resources are now possible for small groups of people, for almost everybody, er, everyone to do. It is possible for people to get information on a lot more things, to communicate what they actually think a lot more clearly and to a lot more people and to connect with others who agree with them a lot more effectively. So, sometimes when I say this, people say, oh, so are you saying basically civic engagement, you know, democratic, democratic participation, freedom of speech, trust in institutions, community reconciliation, social cohesion, world peace, there's an app for that. That's not what I'm saying. There's obviously not an app for any of these things. It's not enough to have a technology tool what really matters are the processes and the organizations and how you use the tool to actually build peace. But technology tools in many ways are gateways. They make it easier for more people to engage in peace building as civic agents. To have the power to engage in building the peace they want to see on the ground. And that's not a theory. It's happening all over the place. Um, so what I thought I'd do is give you my top eight examples of 
peace building and civic engagement using technology. Uh, just to inspire you. And I picked these ones because I like them. There's a lot more stuff going on out there. So many, maybe a lot of you have heard about Refugees Welcome. Refugees Welcome? People heard about them? Yeah. Yeah? So there's a movement called Refugees Welcome. There's also this. Refugees Welcome is an organization that started in Germany. And it's essentially an Airbnb for refugees, to put it really, really easily. It basically matches people who have extra bedrooms, extra space in their homes, with refugees who are arriving in Germany. It's a very simple way of leveraging com community resources to start to build, to start to engage people in a piece that needs to be built. Another example, completely different place, Una Hakika. This is again a project that uses technology to engage community resources. Una Hakika is a project um, that basically has a network of people who receive reports of rumors of violence. So if you think something's happening in your community, it's in, sorry, it's based in Kenya. Um, if you think something's happening in your community, you can send in a message saying, I've heard that tensions are rising in this place. I've heard there was a lot of, uh, a lot of kidnappings in this area. I've heard whatever the rumors is, the rumor is. All of these text messages come into a central system and the team cross-validates the different messages. They also, if they can't figure out what's going on exactly, they'll send someone to try and verify what is happening. And if they can't send someone, they'll send their drone to have a look over, to hover over and film what is happening in an area. And then they will send out a message that either confirms or denies the rumor. So again, a very effective way for people to use technology to engage community resources in building a piece. Another thing that technology is great at doing, it helps to surface new perspectives about peace. So that there isn't just the piece of the gradients, right? Different ideas about peace. Imagine Famagusta is a fantastic project based in Cyprus. Um, for those of you who don't know the, the history of Cyprus, Cyprus is divided in two between Turkish Cyprus and Greek Cyprus. And Famagusta um, <coughs> is one of several towns that has been split in that divide. Um, and imagine Famagusta is an online interactive platform as well as a group of volunteers that are providing a space for people to talk about how they can imagine a united Famagusta. So it's a great way for people to use technology to engage everybody in building a vision of what a united Cyprus could look like. Another example, somewhere completely different. This is a project in Somalia. And in Somalia, um, this is actually a project I've been very closely involved with, so it's, it's very close to my heart. Um, it's, uh, it's run by a, a local think tank uh, with support from a large peace building organization. And what this think tank was finding is that uh, a lot of international organizations have a tendency to speak for Somalis, to say what Somalis think about democracy or what Somalis think about peace. And they wanted to make sure that everybody has had a chance to actually voice their opinion. So what they do is they run a series of participatory opinion polls to get people's opinions about different issues in democracy and in the peace process. And they do that in part old school, people going out with paper and taking people's views, in part through text messages and tablets, and then all the information is put into an online database that has an interactive dashboard, which might be like, wait, who's using the interactive <coughs> dashboard in Somalia? Well, two things you need to know. One is there is high-speed internet in Mogadishu, so actually some people can access it. And the second one is the main people who are using this are policymakers, <coughs> Somali policymakers who have become interested in hearing what people have to say and who find that something like an interactive dashboard is a lot more accessible than the complex statistical reports printed out in PDFs that the World Bank or the UN is producing on Somalia. So another way of getting new perspectives. This is one of my favorite. Has anybody heard of the Peace Factory? No? Israel loves Iran? Okay, I'll give you guys a link to it later. So, 
you heard of it. Yeah. So it's, the Peace Factory was started by this guy, uh, Ronnie Adri, who's, who's in the picture with his daughter. And he actually started it with a Facebook post. He was very tired of the way that he was hearing Israeli politicians and Iranian politicians basically always have this discourse of division. He didn't think that reflected the views of everybody. So he posted on Facebook and he said, Iranians, I love you. I mean, I've only met one Iranian dude. He was in a museum and he seemed nice enough. But really, I don't really know you, so I assume I love you. It was something like that. It was much longer. People loved this post. A lot of people felt that he was saying something that they also identified with. So he started a whole Facebook marketing campaign for peace, where people could unilaterally declare their love for Iranians. It later became Israel loves Palestine, Palestine loves Israel. There's a whole bunch of different pairings. <coughs> they now have different messages. It's not just, I love Iran. It's also things like, not ready to die in your war. They have a program where you can ask to be matched with a friend from a country that is at conflict with yours. So an Israeli can ask for an Iranian friend, and an Iranian can ask for an Israeli friend, even though they don't know anybody. At least there's some kind of a connection. So another way of getting new perspectives. Another thing that technology tools can help a lot more people create is safe spaces. <coughs> safe spaces where people can talk about peace. There are certain contexts where, that, where that's kind of difficult to do. I'm getting a lot of smiles. Is this somebody that, something that people know? Turning tables? No? Do you guys know this? No? Okay. <laughs> it's a nice picture. Okay. <laughs> I don't know whether that was a smile of recognition or a smile of liking it. Um, so Turning Tables is an organization um, that goes to different conflict and post-conflict countries and sets up DJing labs. And these DJing labs are basically places for young people to make music of whatever kind they like. They do a lot of hip hop, but they do a lot of other stuff as well. And to make mu music about how they see their society and what changes they think they want to see. And often it brings together young people of different backgrounds, backgrounds that maybe don't usually work together. And they come together and they make music together. So it's a, safe, it's a safe space and it's a safe medium for people to put out a much more positive message about peace. They have a great um, program called uh, Labs in Camps, I think, which is basically DJ labs in different refugee camps around the world, which is really fantastic. More safe spaces, Solia. Solia is an organization that basically decided that not everybody gets to go to a UWC or a similar kind of face-to-face, long-term exchange with people from around the world, but everybody should have access to meeting people who are different than themselves. And specifically, they were very worried about young people living in the US and young people living in predominantly Muslim societies. Their words, predominantly Muslim societies, but I think you know what I mean. And what they decided is, if people can't travel for exchanges, maybe at least what they can do is meet online. So they run these forums. Um, university students sign up to do this for a term. They get credit from their university to do it. And they basically hang out for three hours online. There's a moderator in the room. So I've moderated some sessions for them. Um, and uh, the moderator usually proposes a topic that is meant to provoke slightly. So it's usually a political uh, topic. It can be a social or cu cultural topic. Probably very similar to the kind of conversations you guys have just by virtue of being at a university. And so for three hours they hang out online and they have a conversation and there's a, you know, a chat room, also like a, they can do a text chat room afterwards. And they do this every week for a term. Um, so again, another way of creating safe spaces. <coughs> And I think you'll enjoy this one. I quite like them. Oh, you heard about this? You did? Yeah, actually, I think the bottom right last year, I think that's my structure. Do you want to tell us what it is? Um, 
Um, well, it's an organization that was started, I think that would be three years ago, uh, by an Israeli guy who wanted to, I think if I remember the story, he saw his son on the computer, um, and he wanted to just bring people together with the power of Minecraft from Israel and Palestine. I think his, uh, his actual line was, everybody likes killing zombies. More than, yeah. <laughs> well, like, the main story was that he wanted to bring people together, um, and this was a platform that he created. It, was, it started with a weekend of three days. Um, and since then, I know that there were five weekends. Recently, they've been dead. Like, I haven't heard that much, but um, I know that they're still planning to continue. So his name is Uri Mutmichel, and he, um, he, is, he is continuing. They started with Minecraft, and they're now using other games. Yeah. Not very good at keeping their website updated. I'll agree with you on that. Um, but he was at our conference last year, so I've okay. spoken to him about the project. And that's exactly what they do. They basically say, look, people can agree on playing together. Particularly teenagers can agree on playing, to, on, on playing together online. And so they created this, they started with Minecraft by creating this idea of Israeli and Palestinian teenagers building a peace village together. Um, and I don't know whether they had this when you did this, but they've now introduced this, this, this chat app that goes with Minecraft that translates between Hebrew and Arabic automatically. Originally when they had it, it was, um, it was yeah. Uh, because I know several times you would say message to translate it from. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was already started. It was on the original as well. Yeah. So it's again a way of creating a safe space through the use of a technology tool. So I can keep going. These are just some of my favorite examples. I think what I get, wanted to give you a sense of is not just what I meant by peace building and civic engagement, but also how technology can be leveraged to empower people to engage as civic agents in peace building in the, all these many different creative ways. But I also don't want you to be naive. I don't want you to leave here thinking, yay technology, you know, it's all good. Basically all we need to do is throw lots of technology at the world and it's going to create peace. I know you wouldn't think that, but just in case. In the same way that you can use technologies to promote peace, you can also use them to foster conflict. And they're used everywhere to foster conflict. I've given you here some of the things that I could think of um, on my way over. So they're used for recruitment. The single biggest way that ISIS recruits, the Daesh recruits, is through social media. They're used for oppression. <coughs> It's true that the internet can provide a lot of opportunities for conversations, that mobile phones connect people a lot more effectively. Um, but when there were social protests in Sudan just a few years ago, one of the first things that the government did is shut down the internet and close off most of their phone networks. It's true that a lot of people have access to information through the internet, even when they're in a, in a situation that is quite difficult, but the Syrian government has a loosely affiliated group called the Syrian Hackers Army, which systematically hacks sources of information that the government doesn't agree with. There are also a lot of governments that censor what is on the internet, that do not want certain messages getting out or coming in. Perhaps most, most notably because its largest, China, does this quite regularly. You can also use technology to promote a single narrative is the only truth. To promote your hegemony, right? So there's a, there's a project that is quite controversial. It was a project that, um, that the US promoted in Cuba. Um, and it was, a, it was a smartphone app. It was called Thunthuneo. And Thunthuneo was uh, meant to be a place where people could come and share their views about different things, about politics, about social events, etc. But the US government hid its involvement in this application. And they did so deliberately because they didn't want Cubans at large or the Cuban government to know that the US was behind it. Which of course makes you, makes you ask the question, why did they hide it? What exactly were they hiding by doing that? There's a lot of these kind of slightly shady uses of technology to promote something where you're not quite sure what's being promoted. Those are maybe the more direct ways that technology can use, be used to foster conflict, right? But here's a few more indirect ones. I'm sure a lot of you use various bits of social media. Um, 
there's a lot of research on how social media connects people, but it's also very good at polarizing people. Why is that? Because when you are on Facebook, for example, you like the stuff that you like, and then the Facebook algorithm serves you more of that stuff that you like. It doesn't serve you the stuff that you don't like, the people you don't agree with. You stop reading them. On Twitter, there's a lot of research that shows that you typically only follow and only tweet at and only interact with people who you already agree with. So if you look at graphs of how Twitter conversations go on political topics, you can almost automatically see the polarization in the debate. It also leads to a fragmentation of narratives, right? You don't know who to believe anymore. There's so much information out there, it's almost impossible to follow it. And it can lead to this strange kind of inequality. If we end up relying too much on technology as a form of empowerment, it means that those who don't have access to it, or who can't read, or who can't engage with it, are left out. So there's a lot of problems with thinking about technology as a way of getting at civic engagement. But really what it comes down to is that technology is just a tool. And what matters is how you use it what processes you use it in. And in the same way, peace is just a civic process. And what matters is how you choose to engage in it. It's not going to be one small group of people to build peace. It takes everybody. And I really, this idea that building peace takes everybody and that technology can be a way for everybody to get involved is something that has gone very deep into the way that I do work. I want to end on another story. Um, it's a story from Cyprus again. And in Cyprus, there's a buffer zone that separates uh, the Turkish Cypriot area from the Greek Cypriot area. And at a moment when there, were, there was a lot happening in the peace talks, a lot of Cypriots felt that the politicians were failing them. And so a large group of Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots occupied the buffer area, the buffer zone. And they were kicked out. And what's ironic is they were kicked out by UN peacekeepers. And as they were being kicked out, they held up a sign. And the sign said, hey UN, we don't know if you realize, but we're trying to help you. Um, and I love this. I love it because it really shows this idea that we need to start thinking about how everybody gets involved in peace building, how it's not just about institutions. And for me, that's where peace meets politics. Peace meets politics when everybody gets involved. You're going to indulge me because I want to leave you with two quotes. Um, and I want to leave you with two quotes because um, I think in a network world we have a collective civic responsibility to build peace. All of us. Everybody sitting here. So if you're up for that challenge, um, I've got two bits of advice that I've picked up over the past few years. And they come in the form of two quotes. So here's the first one. The first one is um, a quote from my favorite peace building academic. And it's a definition of what you need to do personally if you want to engage in building peace. And it says that what you have to do is reach out to those you fear, touch the heart of complexity, imagine beyond what is seen, and risk vulnerability one step at a time. That's what a lot of you guys are doing by being at UWC, by the way. So you're already on the way. And the second quote, oops, sorry. I didn't actually show it to you. <laughs> the second quote that I wanted to leave you with um, is something that um, my colleagues and I say to each other all the time as, I set about, as we set about our work, which is be careful with each other so you can be dangerous together. Um, and I really mean that. I think in this room, there's a lot of people who are going to engage in building peace. So make sure you take care of each other, and then you'll be more dangerous together. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your speech. We'll now open up the floor for any questions.
I have a question. Um, uh, I come from Northern Ireland, uh, and the Cyprus example you gave that draws a lot of parallels to the kind of the segregation we have by religion, uh, Protestants, and Catholics. Um, I'm currently in the process um, of kind of exploring the more kind of social entrepreneurship side, and so are a lot of people in Northern Ireland, because the people are sick of, especially young people um, under the age of 30, are sick and tired of the lack of um, agenda in politics. We're in a power sharing anything. Um, for me, it, do, it, it, it doesn't enhance, it, it, it prevents violence, but it doesn't enhance peace. Um, however, I've seen a lot of UN money, a lot of EU money being spent um, on projects uh, in these communities, but they're not innovative anymore. They're, for me, painting the walls, the peace walls, the segregated communities, they, they, they don't do anything anymore. Um, there needs to be something better than that. Uh, we need more ideas. But the problem is these people, the next generation, are stuck in these communities. And those are the ones we need to have those ideas because people don't listen to the people from the outside. So my question is, how do we get those people out of that kind of, where you're saying, pol that polarized situation? For me, that's the really tricky part. The rest is easy after that. So again, we, you know, there's some really good examples with um, you know, using the internet as a tool, the apps, you know, civic engagement. But for me, I, I, there needs to be something that just clicks. And I'm sorry, that's a really tough question, but yeah. That is a tough question. Um, well, first thing is, I don't think there has to be one, not knowing that much about Northern Ireland, yeah. I would say there's not one thing that needs to click, but probably about 10,000 things yeah. that need to click, right? Um, and so what I mean by that is I, I don't think there's going to be a solution to bring people together, but many small <coughs> solutions. And I say that also because I think sometimes the projects that are supported by large institutions try to be the solution, right? And probably what you need is a lot of locally tailored solutions to different communities, um, which goes much better with a model of social entrepreneurship, uh, which you mentioned. Um, one of the things that a lot of the projects that I showed you have in common is they create a space and the tools and the processes for people to build stuff together. It doesn't matter whether it's music, well, it doesn't matter. Whatever clicks, right? So it could be music, it could be a village on Minecraft, um, it could be um, a collective opinion that can be shared with the president of Somalia. It can be all sorts of things, right? But building something together as opposed to having something brought to them. I think is the key difference. Um, I know that's a bit of an abstract answer, but I think to say something more concrete, I'd have to know Northern Ireland better. I do know that there's an organization that's working on entrepreneurship and peace um, in Northern Ireland. Uh, they're called Trend Conflict, and they started maybe a year ago. I don't know if you've come across them. They could be an interesting place to, to look at, because they have a different model of what they're doing. Okay, our next question is over here. Hola, my name is Jennifer. I'm from, <laughs> I'm from Mexico. So um, the city where I come from, we just had um, elections last summer to, to, like, to have our new mayor of the city. And one of the candidates had um, his publicity and his campaign, he made it uh, only through social media. He didn't spend any like cent or any kind of money or things. Um, an actual publicity, he only like used Facebook or Twitter, or, you know, social media. And he actually won. He like won a, a lot of sympathy from the youth and things like this, mostly. So don't you think that social media can be used or is already used by government as a control of mass? Can you explain how you went from random political campaign on social media to its use as control? Because as, as he he's earning a lot of sympathy from the youth, because it's mostly the youth, the ones that are uh, uh, like the the ones that use social media. So maybe the government can look at this advantage and actually control it. instead of like being used as a tool for peace. It can also be used as a tool for controlling. I mean, I, I completely, I absolutely think that social media can be used as a tool to control um, and to oppress and all of these different things.
However, it's not that simple. It's not <coughs> so simple to have a following on Twitter or on Facebook or on any other social media outlet um, that allows you to influence people's opinion. It's not just enough to set up a Twitter account. You have to really gather, you have to really uh, work on having a, a following, right? So I don't know the concrete example from, from, uh, from your city, um, but I do know that social media has allowed many new players to enter politics, not only in Mexico, also in a lot of European countries, um, also in a number of other Latin American countries. Um, you could say that that's actually lessening the control of traditional parties, because before you needed to have a lot of money to be able to run an election, and now you can use a tool that is essentially free if you have the skill and you have the people and you have the wherewithal to use it correctly. Um, I don't think that governments always know how to do that in a way that they gather enough of the following. If they did, could they use it for misinformation? Of course, absolutely. But it levels the playing field, right? They can and you can. And so can the, this mayoral candidate. <laughs> Sorry, um, cool. All right. um, yes, um, first off, I would like to thank you for giving the speech. I mean, I've heard that being said a lot, and most of the time I think to myself that you know, people are just being polite, but it was actually a fairly decent speech. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm usually not one of the role models, but I must admit that um, what you presented us here with what you're doing, I can very much find myself wanting to do something very similar, just I mean, it seems to me you're just making changes in the world, all over the world. And, I mean, that is a pretty great thing to do. Um, but the main thing I wanted to address was there was one thing during the speech that kind of hit me, sorry, kind of hit me as odd, which was when you mentioned uh, the dictatorship um, from Franco, was his name? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and on the 25-year you know, anniversary, he had 25 years of peace, and you said... Um, that one main idea of peace um, seems better, but that multiple or collection of ideas of peace might seem more fragile, but you said it was superior, basically, to one forced idea of speech. <coughs> you say true, but I'm, I can't actually think of any examples of countries where multiple ideas of peace are clearly present. Even in countries like ours, an idea of peace seems to be very largely understood as you need to communicate, you need to be accepting of everyone. Sorry. So I can't think of a single example where there are a lot of ideas of peace that coexist harmoniously. So maybe, maybe, I'm, an, maybe I'm, I'm an idealist, but I can't think of a single country where many ideas of peace do not coexist. And let me explain why. If in any society, doesn't matter whether it's democratic or not, you didn't have many individual and community ideas of peace that coexisted, you wouldn't have enough police to control all the mayhem. We all, every day, agree to live in peace. And we all have our own idea in our head of what that means. And maybe they kind of coalesce around some kind of shared belief system, but there's enough fragmentation in that for me to say there are individual ideas of peace. And the example about Franco was basically saying that when someone from high up says, this is what peace looks like, there's a lot of people out there who are going to say, oh, not for me. I have no voice. I have no way of expressing what I actually think. I have no way of, ex of eliciting change. That's not peace for me. The, the reason I use that example is because I wanted to make that link with politics or civic engagement, right? You can't have peace if you don't have civic engagement. It's meaningless. It's the peace of the graveyards. You have security, you have safety, but I don't believe you have peace, or at least not the idea that's in my head of what peace is. Thank you for speech. Are you a DJ? So actually, you were talking about uh, censure and uh, the using of media and 
like intimate and all that you said. But like um, when a country puts a sensu about some kind of team on between does does the other countries have some kind of say on it or is it just like within the country that it's like I decide what will be shared or what will not be shared. So you mean um, if a government decides to censor uh, the internet? Yeah, yeah, about some kind of subject, for instance. Yes. Yeah. So the way that works technically is if you access the internet from an IP address that is located in that country, what you view is controlled by the government of that country, technically. There are ways around that. Um, so there are ways to access the internet in an anonymous way and get around that censorship. So if you use a VPN, you can usually get around a lot of censorship. But it is typically just in one country. However, it's a very interesting question you ask because in some situations, when a website has been censored by a country and that website exists outside of the country, it is possible to set up a way for people to be pinged to different places and still be able to access it. So the example that, that comes to mind is Iran. And in Iran, at one point, uh, the government shut down Twitter. And Twitter said, I don't think so. And they managed to get around that censorship. But it's not an easy thing to do. And guess what? It really angers the government. right? So it's not going to happen all the time. But it is possible for it to happen. But usually, you have to be within a country and accessing from an IP address in that country. For the censorship. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lena. Um, my question was founded when you uh, peace, build, peace building methods. You mentioned one of them being used between. Um, Israel and Palestine, it was the, the peace factory one. Um, so my question is really, do you think that these peace building methods have, um, have a role to play in areas of active conflict, like, I mean, like war zones? So really if they could take, uh, take place before the peacekeeping process? Um, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, I think it's much harder. I think it's much, much harder. So for example, in Syria, for an initiative um, like the Peace Factory or like some of the other examples that I was giving you um, to really take place, because you're talking about people who um, are experiencing a level of personal risk already, that to ask them to take a personal stand um, maybe too much, whether it's using technology or something else. That's actually, um, when I gave you, you know I gave you that distinction, I said peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace building. That's also kind of the chronology. Um, I'm not saying that you don't need peacekeeping or peacemaking. I'm just saying it's not enough, right? But peacekeeping is what makes it possible for people to even begin to talk about peace, right? Now that said, there are some active conflict, some situations of active conflict where people are engaging in uh, civic activism to build peace. Um, it's happening in Syria um, in a number of different ways. Um, the, the one example that comes to mind right now is a is a thing called Aimta, which was basically um, an, uh, it was an SMS system that was set up to warn people um, when they were about to be bombed. Didn't last very long, uh, but it was up for a while. So people were trying. Right? It's just that there isn't a lot of space to do this kind of work, I think. The next question is here. Kind of, uh, hello, I'm Padma from RBC, UWC in Germany. So it's, it's kind of, you answer my question, but not really. So basically, uh, I have to to extend this peace, peace building is reality, <coughs> while I believe in peace. But I came from a complex which is, I'm from Western Sahara mm -hmm. and uh, Sahara Occidental. Mm -hmm. So people doesn't believe anymore in peace. They have been, I mean, the people who live in the camps for more than 40 years, they think that, well, they prefer to go to war instead of 
uh, waiting for another 40 years, which is, that's why I'm asking to what extent is realistic with uh, peace building. Thank you. Um, thanks for your question. Um, I'm gonna answer it um, in a cheeky way, um, which is I'm gonna answer a different question, but I'm gonna get to what you're saying. Um, sometimes when I tell people that I, that I work in peace building, they say, oh, you're a pacifist. And I say, no, I'm not. I'm not a pacifist. I do believe that there are legitimate grounds to go to, go to war in certain circumstances. I don't believe that in every circumstance, the only thing we can do is nonviolent activism. I just think that it is an absolute last resort. And I've seen peace building work in a lot of places. Now, I don't know enough about Western Sahara. I know a lot from reading about it, but I haven't been there. I don't know what's going on on the ground. I don't know what kind of activism there is. It's true that in a lot of conflicts like Western Sahara, also like Israel and Palestine, which have been stuck for so long, it can be so easy to give up hope in nonviolent means, right? And I understand that, but I still think that it's our duty to do as much as we can on that road as possible. Um, so I wish I had a concrete answer because I really don't know Western Sahara enough to give you a concrete answer. But I do know other frozen conflicts like Cyprus, like Israel and Palestine. And I see people, like Somalia even, right? I see people over and over again continuing, making small gains, losing the ground, making small gains, losing ground, and continuing to work on peace building. So I do think it's possible. I think it's very hard, right? Um, and uh, it, it's, it's funny because sometimes um, my mom always says that she kind of wishes I worked in humanitarian aid because then when she meets with her friends, she could just say, oh yeah, she's handing out food or, you know, she's, you know, it's much easier to explain than she's building peace, whatever that means. Uh, but it does mean something. And the fact that it's complex doesn't mean that it can't be done. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for your speech. I, I really appreciate this vision of actually getting citizens into this idea of peace and politics because I've been talking about it a lot lately. Um, what I wanted to ask you is what happens or how do we bridge that gap between the politicians and the citizens? How do we actually get politicians to hurt citizens when political activism is taking place and it's being organized political action, but it's still not being heard by, by the high sphere of like conflict solving or policy making? That's a great question also. Um, so I'm going to answer by telling you a few different things. Um, uh, one is an anecdote. Um, I, a while ago I met with a, so let me backtrack for a second. You know that a lot of a lot of peace negotiations take place in in closed rooms, essentially, um, and they're very secretive. They tend to be very secretive, and and a lot of uh, negotiators that I've met argue that this is necessary because it's the only way to insulate the different parties of the conflict enough, so that they can actually get to what their common interest is, as opposed to taking their positions, right? Um, so that's the argument for not involving people in peace negotiations, in the politics of peace, if you want. Um, I, I met, not too long ago, I met a, um, a guy who had been um, involved in, the, in, uh, in negotiations in the Philippines, and, um, and he said that um, social media has meant that it's almost impossible to have a closed-door negotiation, uh, because they're constantly hearing the opinions of people. You know, it's very hard to be insulated. It's not enough to tell people to turn their phones off. It doesn't quite work that way, right? So I think that the door is starting to open because people have more and more access to ways of making their voice heard. That's my first bit of the answer. Second bit of the answer is, um, I think it's happening a lot more in civic activism um, nationally than it is in peace activism. So if you look, I'm gonna give an example from Spain. If you look at how politics has changed in Spain, in the last few years. Um, the forces of change of, in politics in Spain have come from activism. They started as activism, nobody was listening, and then they got organized and they became political parties and they ran in the elections, right? So there is a way to transition <coughs> into having an effect in politics. 
The third thing is, um, I spoke, um, there's this thing called the, the Geneva Peace Talks every year, um, and it's basically this event at the UN, and they bring people in to talk about what they think peace is. Um, and I spoke at the Geneva Peace Talks this year, and one of the things that I said, and I was a little bit like, you know, I'm in this building, and there's like a big UN sign, and I basically said, look, the UN really needs to start opening up. The way that you do negotiation and peace agreements is so closed. And I thought that there was going, you know, there were going to be like, what are you, I don't want to hear this, essentially. And a lot of people reacted by saying, yes, we're moving in that direction. There's an understanding that there has to be more direct engagement. So if you take the negotiations in Syria, right now, the civic engagement in the Syrian peace talks is mostly with um, what are called civic leaders that are brought in to the negotiation table. Often, they are already out of Syria. They're not actually living in Syria. Could there be a way to engage more Syrians more directly, at least to have their opinions heard while the negotiations are going on? I think there could be, but I don't think, I don't think we've gotten to the place where we can make that happen quite yet. I think it's going to happen, basically. not talk to hearing that Syrians have a say in, it, in, in, in the decision that is being made anymore. Um, the last talks in Vienna did not involve any Syrian party at all. Um, I, I just wanted to bring that to, 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 to the audience that there's no actual civic engagement of the people of, or any formal or civic or any type of engagement of Syrians in the Syrian peace talks, which is ironic. And the same could be said about South Sudan, for example. Right? Yeah. Many of the, of the peace talks are quite closed and involve a very small selection of people. I think the Syria peace talks in Vienna are maybe a particularly bad example as well. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> Hello, um, I come from Belarus. I'm back home. Um, the greatest fear people have is the fear of war. Um, that's firstly because of the legacy of the Second World War that is worshipped as the um, greatest like disaster that happened to our country, to our people. And um, recently because of the war in Ukraine, because of the, which was triggered by um, first peaceful, uh, peaceful protests, but, but then which rose to almost the state of civil war and that, that followed uh, with the war in the Eastern Ukraine. I actually gave the workshop on that just now. Um, so uh, m the problem is that people, so because of this fear of the war, all the, any attempts to, uh, to political activism are um, sort of destroyed by the mentality of the masses that, um, let's say, well, at least we don't have war. So any problem is answered with, well, but it's good we don't have war how to deal with this situation, how to <coughs> engage civil society in the, when such a mentality is present. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's another great question. Um, I'm going to go back to this example I gave you about Spain and the piece of the graveyards, right? So that's a really nice story, but you know, the end of that story is that was 1964, and it took until Franco died in 1975 for anything to change in Spain. So there was a group of people who didn't think that it was just absence of war that was enough in Spain. But it took a very long time for any kind of social change to happen. Um, so I say that because I, I don't know Belarus, and I, I can't comment on, on what is happening. Um, but I think that um, when a population fears something and puts security above anything else, it can take a very long time for social change to happen. Um, and I think it's a slow chipping away, creating safe spaces where people can talk, putting forward other messages. Um, yeah. Uh, just a question up here. Hi, I'm uh, I'm, Adal, I'm, I'm, I'm half Dutch, half Vivian. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I, uh, I really find it really inspiring how you, how you put it, you know, building peace with, uh, with other people. Either way, I would like to uh, talk about Libya and its current situation. And, um, well, after Gaddafi was overthrown, it, it sort of became sort of a nurturing ground for, for terrorists and different groups. And I was just wondering, how can you 
build up peace when people still have this like this this like people are still having sectarian tribal like mentality in their head how, how can you how can you how can you really get into the minds of those people because they because Gaddafi, Gaddafi ruled the country purely based on where people came from and where you what your last name was and that that defined you as a person and people are having conflicts purely because of that reason although they can't seem to differentiate you know they can't seem to realize that we're all Libyans and it's just it's a it's something that completely is mind-boggling and I, I can't seem to understand it. Um, so I have been to Libya, um, to Benghazi and to Tripoli. Um, but I don't feel I know the tribal politics well enough to answer directly about Libya. So I'm going to answer about Sudan instead. The reason for that is that I spent a lot more time in Sudan. And what you're saying is, is, is very similar to some of the issues in Sudan where tribal identity gets in the way of people understanding that they might have a common interest, a common way of living together. Um, and I think a lot of it is about getting people to meet and build things together. Um, I said that earlier about Northern Ireland, but I'll repeat it now. And I'll give you an example that I didn't put up here. Um, a little while ago, um, I spent some time in, on the border between Sudan and South Sudan, working with people to make films together people from different tribes, to make films about how it was to live together, what it was actually like. And getting those stories out to lots of people, doing film screenings of those stories and making sure there was a conversation afterwards, was a great way of starting to create a narrative that wasn't about tribalism, but it was about common experiences, living together. Um, so I think the kind of work that probably needs to do, be done in a place like Libya is a work of creating new narratives. Narratives that aren't the narrative that Gaddafi promoted, that aren't the narratives of division that probably support terrorist recruitment, essentially, um, but are narratives that bring people together. And I think that's done by creating spaces where people can do that. So that can be through film. That's what we were doing in Sudan and South Sudan. But it can be done in many other ways. And I think it's that kind of community work that will begin to build the ground for you to be able to get beyond tribal politics. Our next question over here. Hi again. Um, so uh, one of the eight um, examples that you gave, uh, one of us forgot you was the uh, Solia one, if I pronounced correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as you said, you moderated some of the sessions. Yeah. Um, so I got two short questions about that. But the first one is, could you like elaborate some of your experiences? You said that I'm assuming that have you ever um, encountered where people have actually come closer? Have you seen people develop over it? Are there any stories you could share from that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, lots of different little ones. One of my favorite ones is that um, usually what happens at the beginning of a Solia trimester is that everyone agrees with everyone else. And the reason is that we're all being so polite and so tolerant, aren't we? Aren't we, UWC students, being so polite and so tolerant? Yeah? And then about halfway through, maybe you start going, well, I mean, I don't totally agree with that. Or, you know, I agree, but this makes me uncomfortable. So that's one thing, right? One thing is that I think part of actually people becoming closer is people becoming more honest with each other. Um, and that's something that happens in Solia um, quite a lot. Um, the other thing is um, we do a lot of work on uh, actually getting people to identify what things are similar between them. And often that has to do with talking about um, your likes and your dislikes, your hobbies, your family, uh, the things that pretty much everybody has in common. Um, and I've seen a lot of people really start to open up in the political discussions after they've had that kind of human contact. Right? It's like, okay, this guy has... A sister that's the age of my sister. Um, so suddenly I have something in common and then I can talk about other things. Um, and then the other thing is, um, so Leah, if you want to get into some of the uh, actual evaluation of the program, they do a very detailed evaluation of what effect this has on the participants over time. And so they have a lot of data that shows that people who participate in this program continue to maintain the friendships they make in the program and that it significantly changes their outlook 
um, of the world in general. They feel more connected, basically. Thank you. Um, one more just really short question about quotes currently so projected. Yeah. Um, this being Ivy, who can I quote on this? Uh, this one, it doesn't really have an author. So, you? No, no, don't quote me. Don't quote me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quote my friend. Well, I, I'll yeah, give I you can't. my name later. <coughs> she came up with it. Sorry? One of the other founders of my company, you can quote her. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Next questions from her. Uh, what does that quote really mean to you? What does it mean to me? Yeah, and uh, can you give us an example? It means if you're going to go and spend a month on the border between Sudan and South Sudan, make sure you bring in enough chocolate for your team members. <laughs> um, no. I mean, that's part of it. Um, I think it means... I think it means that if you, particularly in a place like AWC, if you want to really make change in the world, you're going to need a lot of allies. Um, and you're going to need allies that you didn't think you needed. So it's not just your friends, it's not just the people you agree with. Um, and that's what I mean about be careful with each other. You know, you might not agree with someone on something, but maybe there's a fundamental underlying value, maybe peace, that does bring you together, right? And being dangerous together literally means there's a lot of power in collective action. Um, and so if you're going to try and make a big change in the world, you're going to need a lot of people to do that dangerous thing, which is trying to change the world. Does that answer your question? Also bring chocolate for your teammates. <laughs> uh, our next question is from up here. Um, sorry for my English, first of all. Uh, I want to say that here in EWC we are paying so much money for getting this information about peace, but there are so many regions that this kind of information is not accessible for them. So how make it possible? Like, not only these people, but others who lose their hope that one day it will be peace. It very, it's really very beautiful to make definitions of peace it's, yeah, it's really beautiful from the side, but when you actually feeling that pain in your skin, it's very difficult. So I don't want to just talk about peace, like we are talking a lot, I need actions. And like a person who, whose brother now in Haraba, fighting, I want to see, like it, how can we make this information accessible for all around the world? Like, how we can make it possible? Thank you. You want an answer to that? It's, a, it's an impossible question because it's a question without an answer. And I say that because the answer is, what are we each going to do to get this out to people? I can tell you what I do. I've told you that in this presentation. I haven't been working in every country in the world, but I've tried to go to some places, and I've tried to bring conversations about peace closer to people. But more importantly, there's a lot of people in places that are experiencing conflict that are having conversations about how they want a different world. I'm sure your brother's one of them. And so I think the only answer I can give to a question like that is to nearly throw it back to everybody in this room. What are we going to do to make sure that more people are talking about peace? I don't think it's impossible for more people to be talking about peace. You're right, it's not just in a UWC. Certainly a UWC isn't going to bring peace to the world. But it's a safe place for us to start talking about it and start unpacking it and start understanding what we can do and then go out into the world, right? I mean, that's what you're all going to do after you go to see, I hope. That's my hope. Our next question is also from here. Uh, 
Hello, uh, my name is Rohan, I'm from Sudan. So uh, you just talked about uh, tribalism and how it is in Sudan and how the problem is currently in South Sudan. But for example, if the problem is, like I just gave a worship about the problem, the conflict of Darfur. But if the problem of tribalism is coming from the government, how do we solve that? Because, for example, like they were, even though they had a little bit of conflict of settlements and coming of Arab tribes to African tribes and all this, but then the main conflict is coming from the government itself. So, so, how do you help? How do you fix that in a way? Like, what is the solution if the government are the first people who take actions against it? That's a great question. And also, it's a law, right? Yeah, I read your application. I lived in Sudan for three years and I go back very often and I'm part of the University of Sudan selection committee so we can talk later about that um, and that's a great question um, I think Sudan I mean Sudan is a you know we can have a longer conversation about this later, but essentially what's happening in Sudan is, as you're rightly pointing out, the government is instrumentalizing tribalism, right? They're using it as a political weapon, essentially, uh, and sometimes as a, as, a, as a weapon of violence, um, particularly in, in Darfur, but also in the Nuba Mountains, in Kordofan in general, etc. You know this. Um, and... You know, I, I've done a few small projects in Sudan that what they try to do is propose a counter-narrative. So the kind of situation that you're talking about is this, Sudan is very difficult to work in because it is so controlled, right? And the government has so much control over information and over communications. And so they propose one narrative. And that narrative, for most people, it's the only thing that they hear. And so I think the only thing that we can do to chip away at that kind of a situation is to find ways of proposing different narratives. Um, so in Sudan, for example, this thing that I was talking about, the, the, the cross-border filmmaking, this was actually with, the, with Kordofan, so it wasn't Darfur. Um, but it was this idea of, can people tell a different story from their experience to what the government is feeding them? And they did tell a different story, provided the space. Now, I'll also tell you, that the Misaria who came in to South Sudan to work with the Dinka and Gok on making these films had to come over disguised as traders because they were concerned that the government was going to stop them on the way over. So it is a very risky thing to do. In a place like Sudan in particular, proposing an alternative narrative isn't like doing that in a democratic society where you have certain protections. Um, it is possible to begin to chip away at a one single narrative like that. Um, but it's going to be a lot harder in a place like Sudan, a lot harder. There's a great project in Darfur um, with an organization called Sudia, whose offices you went to for your interview, um, and, uh, and we can talk about that later if you want, because I think it might be of interest to you if you're interested in Darfur particularly. Thank you. Okay, our next question is from down here. Hi, uh, I'm Abunita, I'm from Kosovo. Uh, I, I don't believe that when you see peace through the lenses of politics is the peace that we want. I think it's so stupid. I know I am an idealist, I don't know if I can say that. Like, I would love the world to be in peace, love and all that, but then when I uh, go back to my country, we have this, I'm from Kosovo, and we have this problem with Serbia, and then you hear the government made this stupid decision when he's giving a lot of, like, not land, but he's giving power to the Serbian uh, minorities in the country, and it's almost like the Serbian government is taking the power on these places. And I know that this thing, like a lot of people tell me, but isn't it worth it because it's gonna bring peace, but do you think it's worth having this kind of peace? What do you mean by this kind of peace? Like, peace, but not fair. Do you think it's worth it? Uh, no. Do you think that's peace? Well, that's what they say. I wanted to hear your opinion. <laughs> it doesn't sound like peace to me, but I also don't know if it's possible all that well, right? So I'd have to ask you a lot more questions. But you're making a broader point about 
maybe in some situations, politicians' definition of what peace means is not what I mean by peace, which is the same thing as Franco saying that he'd done 25 years of peace, right? Or any, any person who's in power who says, this is peace, and that's it, we're done, <coughs> right? Um, but the point is that politics does hold a lot of power. It's not the only way to make change, but it's a way to make change. So if you don't think that politicians in Kosovo are working for what, for what peace is, you can try and call them out. You can work with organizations, which I'm sure exist in Kosovo, that oppose what the government is saying. You can run for office. Maybe not right now, but you could run for office sometime. I don't think that saying that politics can't meet peace is true. I think that politics in many places does not meet peace, but it can, and I think it should, right? So I think it's more about figuring out what we can do to make sure that politics and peace come close together. Hello, so my name is Shaden and I'm from Morocco. Um, firstly, I really admire what you're saying to us, what you're doing, because you're acting a lot. And this is really inspiring. I also heard a lot and understood what you were saying about creating new spaces where people could meet, stand up for their perspective of peace, and like, just have a dialogue, and that could make a lot of difference, and that does make a lot of difference. <coughs> but since we all have different perspectives of peace, how do I deal with a monarchy or government that will put me in jail if I stand up for my perspective of peace? I don't know, how do you think you should deal with it? I'm just really less as well. <laughs> Carefully, right? I, I think that even in societies where there is very little space, there is some space. And so it's about getting creative about what spaces we can occupy and what spaces we can't what things we can do at some personal risk, but at not great personal risk. What risks are we willing to take to stand up for what we believe in, right? Um, and these are all the kind of questions that people ask themselves when they're standing for peace anywhere, you know? Whether it's a mayoral candidate in, in a Mexican city, um, or somebody in Morocco, or somebody in Sudan. Um, I just... <coughs> I think the answer is, it really depends on the place where you are. And you need to really think about, number one, what risk is this exposing me to? Number two, what risk am I willing to take? Um, number three, is this the most strategic use of my ability to take risks, right? So I don't know if that's too big an answer, but it so depends on the situation. Right? Thanks a lot. Okay. I think that's all, if there's no other questions. Uh, we have time for uh, one more question. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rita, I'm also from Morocco. Um, my question was, you said that dialogue is a key, well, you kind of implied that dialogue is a key piece. But what do you do if people don't want to discuss, if they just refuse to speak to each other, and they don't want to? not explicitly not wanting peace, but maybe may, they might not want to communicate because they believe their opinion is superior to the one of the other. We try a different conversation. I mean, you keep trying. I don't, I don't know what else to say apart from um, you try a different conversation, you keep trying. There's always someone who wants to talk about something that somewhat resembles peace. There's always um, a story that they can share about a time when they got close to each other. Maybe stop using the word peace. Maybe that's putting them off. Maybe talk about living well with your neighbors. Maybe talk about marrying whoever you want to marry. Um, make it more real for their own lives, you know? 
Um, because that's that's kind of what it comes down to this whole idea of like there are many ideas of peace, right? Like we all basically want to live in a way that fulfills what we think are our good expectations of life. So find what those entry points are and then find what links them. Um, and I think that's the place where you can begin to talk about something that is somewhere close to peace. Um, so change the conversation. They would, if you say peace and they're like, ah, then you know, don't talk about that. Uh, some people, peace is a dirty word because it's, you know, it's got political or historical connotations. Thank you so much for your speech, and we have a little token of appreciation. Oh. Okay, so the schedule from here on out is at this dinner at 6, and that goes till 7 p.m. as normal. Um, after that, we have an intercultural evening, which starts at 8 and goes till 10. Um, and the intercultural evening is basically a chance for you to view politics and peace through a more personal lens, a lens um, about your own cultural identity of who you are, a chance to tell stories, um, and maybe what we do or what we say isn't who we are, but what we're capable of when we least expect it. So let this night be a night of series of unexpected revelations, of unexpected stories, of unexpected songs that come out. Um, after the first five set performances, there'll be a chance for anyone who's there to say what they want, if that's um, to sing a song, if that's to say a quote, or if that's to tell their own story of where they've come from and who they are. Um, so I look forward to seeing all of you there. So I think that's it. And dinner will be served in at six.